Have you ever thought about what would happen if you went missing? Imagine taking a walk into the woods and just blinking out of existence for anyone who knew you. No explanation, no clues, just gone. That was one of my biggest fears growing up. And after researching this case, it's safe to say I've reinforced that fear in myself. Hi, I'm Dakota Rivers. I'm an Arizona-based drag artist with a love for all things dark, spooky, and mysterious. And this is Dakota the Dark Side, a podcast where I guide you through true stories of the terrible and unknown. And you'd better believe I have my GPS and flashlight at the ready for this one. And my mother on speed dial, just in case. As of December of 2019, the National Crime Information Center, or NCIC, had nearly 87,500 active missing persons cases in the U.S., 80% of most cases are wrapped up in less than 24 hours and are easily explainable. A runaway teen, a family member falls out of contact for a bit, or just Uncle Joe getting stranded in the parking lot after misplacing the Cadillac. Typical stuff. The Jameson case is one of these missing persons cases, but it definitely stands out as a unique one that would prove to be as intriguing as it is mysterious. The story of their disappearance careens out of control at points, involving elements like Satanism, witchcraft, cults, Nazis, and meth gangs. Everything but Bigfoot and aliens, it seems. And this is one story that only becomes more complicated after the missing persons are found. On December 8th, 2009, the Jameson family seemed to simply vanish off the face of the earth, Bobby Jameson, age 44, his wife, Sherilyn, age 40, and their daughter, Madison, age 6, were already a fairly reclusive and private family when they packed up their truck with their dog, Maisie, and made that fateful final trip to the San Bose Mountains in Oklahoma. But what led to this? What circumstances could bring a whole family to just poof out of existence? Let's just say the circumstances leading up to the incident were interesting, to say the least. Let's go back to the beginning. The Jamesons were your average, church-going, nature-loving, somewhat private family. They lived in the small town of Eufaula, Oklahoma, with a population of about 3,000 residents. It can be assumed that the family lived on a lower income, since Bobby was on disability due to a back injury sustained in a car accident in 2003. Adding to their money struggles was also a legal battle with Bobby's father, Bob Sr., over a money dispute. According to friends, Bobby and Sherilyn were interested in purchasing land in the Red Oak area, which is about 30 miles away from Eufaula. Supposedly, the family had planned on moving into the area to live in, and I'm totally serious when I say this, a shipping container. Now, I'm all for unique living arrangements and tiny homes, but this seems to be a bit too far, even for the trendiest of Instagram off-grid gentrifiers. And if you're like me, you were picturing the shipping container homes that you see on Pinterest with the perfect styling and the amenities. But let me be the first to disappoint you by saying that this, from what I can tell at least, was literally just a metal box that they were going to plop in the middle of the woods and set up camp. Home sweet home. Anyways, this was reportedly their reason for being that far from home that day. Apparently, they had met with a representative of the landowner of the property that the Jamesons were interested in purchasing. A 40-acre plot, by the way. And after that meeting, the family parked, went for a short walk, returned to the truck, and it was at that point they disappeared. The final movements of the family can be substantiated by Bobby's GPS, which was found after the disappearance. The initial missing persons report came in a few days after the family's trip to the Sambo's area. After a weekend had passed, friends of the Jamesons had become concerned. The case was picked up by Sheriff Israel Beauchamp, who wasn't concerned at first. I mean, families decide to pick up and disappear into the woods all the time around here, right? It's what you do. Well, not quite. The reality of the situation really set in on October 16th, about a week after the family was last seen. It was on this day that a group of men hunting on dirt bikes called in to report the Jamesons car on the side of the road. Apparently, they had seen the car days earlier, but it was only after seeing it still abandoned that they became suspicious. Upon inspection of the car, the Jameson's dog, Maisie, was discovered, starving and dehydrated and very near death. I bet she was pissed that those guys had passed her by earlier. I sure know I would have been. She wasn't the only odd discovery, however. In the car, police found the Jamesons had left many of their personal items, including their phones, wallets, clothes, jackets, a GPS, oh, and $32,000 in cash. 
The cache was found in a bag under the passenger seat, and its discovery as well as its location as a point of contention among anyone who discussed this case. Definitely an odd situation, but as we will discuss, the family had their fair share of eccentricities. And they totally seem like the type to not trust things like the bank or the government. Might not be the worst call if I'm being honest. The most popular theory concerning the money is that it was meant to pay for the 40-acre plot that the family had gone to scout out. But if that's the case, then what was it still doing in the car after the meeting? Another pretty strange thing found in the car was actually an 11-page note written by Sherilyn to her husband, Bobby. Now, this happened to not be the pinnacle of love notes, but instead a complete list of the reasons why she hated him, including him being a, quote, hermit, and also that he didn't care for their daughter and that she wanted a divorce. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think taking a manifesto of disdain addressed to your husband with you on a trip into the woods is the best of ideas. But maybe I'm just not a big risk taker. However, this wasn't the only indicator of issues in the family, and it definitely wasn't the first bit of odd behavior from Sherilyn. Sherilyn was diagnosed bipolar at a young age, and according to those close to her, she was known to not keep up with her medication and, as a result, was prone to bouts of lashing out and depressive anger. Some think that this could explain the letter she had written. Her outbursts and her reactive behavior had also been worsening throughout the spring and summer of 2009. This was something that many close to her noticed in the months leading up to the disappearance, and this wasn't the first time there was unrest in Sherilyn's home life. Sherilyn's son from a previous marriage, Colton, had seen her just two weeks before the family's disappearance. According to him, she had made no mention of their move to the Sandbills area, much less their shipping container plan. It had only been a few months since Sherilyn's ex-husband had taken custody of Colton, who, incidentally, provided a look into his mother's mental state at the custody hearing. According to 12-year-old Colton, his mother was, quote, very depressed and acting strangely. Even Sherilyn's mother, Connie Kokotan, reported some strange behavior from her daughter. She claimed, quote, Sherilyn was a very strong-willed person, but I saw her change dramatically. She followed that up by saying, quote, She became very illogical. One day, she drove me to Oklahoma City, dropped me off on the street. She told me, get out of my car. So I did. I know that my mother and I haven't always seen eye to eye, but I can confidently say that I've never had the desire to just dump her off in another city. But hold on. That's not the end of the odd behavior, not by a long shot. On October 8th, the day the family were last seen, their outdoor security cameras captured the couple making several trips back and forth from their car. On the footage, you can see them bring out luggage, one piece in particular being Sharon's brown leather briefcase which was very noticeably missing from the vehicle when it was searched a week later. Now, I watched this footage, and regardless of the horrific frame rate of the video, you can see that the two never really stopped to speak with one another, and it's even been determined that they seem to be moving in a trance-like state, mostly evidenced by the fact that they seem to make several pauses during the trips back and forth, and seem to pause and stare with no explanation at some points. It's mainly thanks to the CCTV footage that many speculate potential drug use by the Jamison parents. I'll say right now that there's no substantial evidence of this, especially the fact that there was no drug paraphernalia in the home or car when those places were searched after they were reported missing. Speaking of the search, that part of the story had its own set of challenges and interesting twists as well. Now, let's go over the timeline before we go into the search for the Jamison family. First, the CCTV footage of the Jameson home captures Bobby and Sherilyn packing up the car with luggage, their daughter Madison, and their dog Maisie, and leaving for the day. Second, they all drive about 30 miles east to meet the representative and discuss the land for sale. Third, after the meeting, they drive to a secluded area in the mountains and leave their car at least once to walk to a hill not far from where they stopped. After this, the car is abandoned for seemingly no reason, with their belongings and dog still inside. As I mentioned earlier, Bobby's GPS was found in the car, which is how we know that the family had taken the short walk. And it's also what gave investigators the first lead on the search. On the day the family's vehicle was discovered, the route of the GPS was followed, and small footprints believed to be Madison's were found along the way. It's believed the family stayed at the hill for about 15 minutes before returning. 
It's also assumed that during this time, a picture of Madison was taken, which was found later on Bobby's phone. It's unclear what's happening in the picture, but the internet and the media were abuzz with theories about her demeanor in the photo, which portrays only the young Jameson daughter who, depending on who you ask, looks either to be laughing or in distress. I'll have this photo posted on social so you can take a look at it for yourself. But to me, she doesn't seem to be having a great time. But feel free to let me know what you think. Now, back to the car. It seems that after the Jamesons returned from their walk, they attempted to drive off. This is based on the abnormal positioning of the car on the side of the road. This in itself I find odd. I can't think of many things that would make me hastily pull to the side of the road and abandon my vehicle and my belongings. Well, except maybe a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks. Nah, there's a couple things. In any case, it's strange. And of course, the jumping off point of a few theories all on its own. In all of those theories, however, one thing is universally agreed upon. Someone or something in the road was likely preventing them from leaving. But we'll visit that a bit later. On October 17th, the day after the discovery and search of the vehicle, a full-scale search began to attempt to find the family. This was definitely a high-priority situation, especially since the Jamesons didn't appear to be prepared to rough it in the woods in the cold for very long. The search party included hundreds of volunteers, two helicopters, horses, mules, quad bikes, 16 canine teams, and even a drone. It was quickly made apparent that the aerial searches would be useless, however, since the undergrowth in the area made it nearly impossible to spot anything of note. And this wasn't the only issue during the search effort either. A number of factors made it exceedingly difficult to try and carry on. When it came to ground crews, their job was made harder with roads that were poorly maintained, and there was even the looming threat of the weather taking a turn for the worse and producing flash floods. Not only that, but the timing was made even worse with deer hunting season beginning the following weekend. The search party faced the threat of all these conditions putting lives at risk if they continued, so the search was called off after about a week. The last point is pretty frustrating to me in particular. What, they couldn't delay hunting season for a bit longer and find a missing family? And that takes us to the end of the search. No further clues were uncovered, and obviously the family remained missing. It seemed that the investigation had hit a wall. But it wasn't going to stay that way. Weeks led to months with no further answers, but still continued reassurances from the FBI and other agencies involved in the case. Sheriff Beauchamp continued to lead the investigation and was quoted as saying, quote, A lot of investigators would love to have as many leads as we do. The problem is they lead in so many different directions. Essentially, as you begin to peel back the layers of the family's history, so many possibilities become evident and it's pretty difficult to make sense of them. It definitely doesn't help that the speculation continues among online forums, attempting to piece together theories with evidence that, to be honest, is flimsy at best. So, what actually happened? Well, let's take a look at some of the theories of what could have contributed to the Jamesons' odd disappearance. The first one of which I find to be a better fit in a novel, like the Amityville Horror, than in the speculation for a very real missing persons case. In short, I don't buy it, but let's carry on anyways. First, I want to preface this section by making it known that Bobby and Sherilyn were heavily religious. They were good, practicing, church-going Christians, and as such, it was surprising to learn that they had actually dabbled a bit in Satanism and witchcraft. The Jameson parents were highly fascinated with spirituality and the idea of magic, but this fascination is believed by some to be the catalyst of many of the problems in their lives. According to those close to the family, the Jamesons believed their home was haunted, and that there were even demons and other such beings living on their roof of all places, tormenting them day and night. Bobby and Sherilyn even said that Madison had begun speaking of an imaginary friend who she called Emily, and after a short while, they even began to believe that she was real. But not just that, also that she was an evil entity who also lived on the roof and joined in on the regular harassment of the family. Surprisingly, it's not just the family that reported and believed that these things were happening, it seems. A friend of Sherilyn's, Nikki Shenold, stated, quote, But in all seriousness, that house is haunted. I don't want to sound crazy, but whenever I went in there, I felt a horrible presence. 
I would leave so down and depressed. Bobby, who was such a gentle man, would suddenly come at her and his eyes would be completely dead and black like he was possessed. Ah, but all is not lost in the Jameson household, dear listener. Sherilyn believed that she had the power to cast out the demons plaguing their home, and she was determined to do so. As confirmed in the later search of the home, she would leave out notes reading, quote, Get out, Satan, in multiple places in an attempt to drive out the evil entities. Honestly, it wouldn't be my first choice, but, you know, you do what you gotta do, I suppose. Bobby was also attempting to cleanse the household of their ghost infestation, and he took their pleas for help to their pastor, Gary Brandon, who said Bobby had approached him earlier in the year of 2009, saying he was, quote, locked in spiritual warfare. It was during this conversation that Bobby had asked the pastor if he was in possession of any, quote, special bullets to shoot the ghosts with, whatever that means. Obviously, it seemed that Pastor Gary Brandon was fresh out of those at the moment, so Bobby opted to purchase a satanic Bible, hoping that he would find something useful in the words of old Anton LaVey. Good luck with that, Bobby. Now, after all the haunting shenanigans, I can't say that the Jamesons were the best neighbors to have living next door, but that level of unsettling was kicked up a notch when Sherilyn extended her odd behavior outside of the home. Apparently, she believed her neighbors were poisoning her cat, and in response, she would spray paint messages on the aforementioned shipping container. A few of them read, quote, three black cats killed to date by people in this area, and also, quote, witches don't like their black cat killed. It's safe to say that even in the year leading up to the drive out to the Sandspills Mountain, things at the Jameson household were devolving for sure. And it's believed by some that it was the ghostly activity that ultimately drove them from their home to their demise in the wilderness of Oklahoma. Anyways, the next few theories get a bit more realistic, but they definitely don't lose the grandeur of the first, so don't you worry. Theory number two. The family fell victim to a white supremacist or KKK sympathizer slash associate. Yeah, it goes from one extreme to another. In the summer of 2009... Bobby needed to hire some help around the house due to his bad back. He brought in Kenneth Bellows, who worked as a handyman, to stay with the family and just ease some of the daily burdens of Bobby. Unfortunately, just like most roommate situations, it wasn't long before Kenneth began to show his true colors. The inciting factor in the friction between Kenneth and the family was when he found out that Sherilyn had some Native American blood in her family. So, like the dirtbag that he was, he began antagonizing her whenever Bobby wasn't around. This didn't last long, because, frankly, Sherilyn was a badass and wasn't going to take any crap from any wannabe Nazi SOB. The interactions came to head one day when Bobby was out of town. Kenneth supposedly approached Sherilyn and got in her face, racially abusing her and getting increasingly violent. Sherilyn refused to back down, so she went into her home, grabbed her pistol, and threatened Bellows with it, demanding he leave the property. Bellows, the shining star that he was... Resisted leaving for a bit, you know, like a dumbass. It took Sherilyn shooting a few rounds at his feet to get him to scurry away, but I can imagine this pissed him off and potentially cracked his ego a bit as well. Good for you, Sherilyn. Now, don't get too excited. It's easy to think that this incident was the event that could have inspired a murder plot from a raging racist, but Bellows was in fact investigated by the FBI and he was cleared of any direct involvement. Apparently, he had an alibi for October 8th, but there has been speculation that he could have had associates carry out a revenge plot against the family for him. However, there is no evidence that this is the case, so we're left with another theory dead in the water. Now, if you'll remember, I had discussed Bobby's father, Bob Sr., whom the family had some friction with prior to October 2009. As it turns out, Bob Sr. was a suspect early on in the case, and for good reason. Let's explore the dynamic of that a bit more. As I said earlier, the family had an active lawsuit against Bob Sr., which was just the most recent event in the volatile relationship between him and his son's family. The lawsuit was over a money dispute. Bob Sr. had purchased a gas station and for a while had Bobby work there for free, but with the understanding that he would get a cut of the money upon the sale of the business. As you can imagine, Bobby never saw one red cent, and it soured the relationship between the father and son pretty quickly. 
Bobby's mother said, quote, Bobby fought for his money, and it all turned a bit ugly. I don't want to turn Bob into a monster, but he did threaten the family. We had split it by that stage. There were a few confrontations, and we were worried, so I installed security cameras at the house. You heard that right. Bob Sr., the grandfather, was the reason that the security cameras were installed in the first place at the Jameson household. Supposedly, disputes with the grandfather had led to violence in the past, and the Jamesons were genuinely afraid that he was dangerous. According to those close to the family, Bob Sr. felt that he was above the law and had links to gangs, sex work, and even meth. It's also alleged that Bob Sr. had threatened death to the family multiple times, two times specifically being November 2008 and again in April of 2009. During the November incident, Bob Sr. had allegedly even run over Bobby with his car. However, at the age of 67, Bob Sr. was in poor health, and at the time of the Jameson family's disappearance, he was in a rest home. Investigators were able to confirm the alibi and did clear him of direct involvement. As with Bellows, it has also been speculated that given his alleged connection to Mexican cartels in Texas, it could also have been possible for Bob Sr. to order a hit on the family. But like with everything else, there's no concrete evidence to come to that conclusion at all. Bob Sr.'s brother, Jack, said about the allegations, quote, He was either in the hospital or a rest home. I just don't think he was involved. He was disturbed at the time, but I'm pretty sure he was not capable of being involved in that. As it turned out, Bob Sr. passed away two months after the Jamesons' disappearance, and with him went any possibility of discovering if he had any involvement. Okay, so now we come to the last remaining theories, which involved the family skipping town for one reason or another. Was it possible that something happened in the Jamesons' lives that forced them to begin a new life? I mean, it seemed they were already planning on going off-grid to some extent, so maybe this was their plan coming to fruition. One of the most popular speculations regarding the idea of the family's voluntary disappearance was that they had faked their death in order to escape some sort of retribution at the hands of drug lords or other gangs. It is true that Oklahoma has areas of high drug activity, and when you think about the large stash of money found in the car, it could possibly tie back to some sort of drug involvement. Friends of the family had told investigators that in the weeks leading up to October 8th, the family, specifically Bobby and Sherilyn, were beginning to seem agitated and even looked skinnier. Some say that they acted paranoid or like they felt that somebody was after them. Many armchair detectives point to this as a sign that they were on drugs, combined with other odd behavior, including that observed in the security cameras. Obviously, I can't be certain, but I find it hard to believe that Bobby or Sherilyn were on drugs since there was no evidence that was found in the home or car, and they would have to be damn good at hiding it for there to be no trace of anything like that found. The secondary speculation was that the Jamesons had faked their death in order to shake a gang that had been coming after them. Bobby had lodged a complaint earlier that year against someone in their neighborhood for supposedly operating a meth lab out of their home. Could it be that the group that Bobby had reported came after them in retaliation and the family faked their death in order to escape? Some point at the way that the car was left as evidence that they were attempting to ditch anything that could be tracked back to them. Sadly, though, this doesn't seem to be the case. Not only does it not add up from a logical standpoint, but there was a discovery soon to be made that would put that idea to bed for the most part. Let's fast forward a little bit. It had been four years since the discovery of the Jamesons' vehicle and the ill-fated search for the three family members. But Sheriff Beauchamp had continued on, following any lead he could to try and find a resolution. As it turns out, the family had never made it very far from their car at all. On November 16th, 2013, a man scouting for deer in the area made a pretty gruesome discovery. He discovered first a human skull, then two more one being smaller than the other. After calling it in, investigators quickly took over and uncovered more bones, bone fragments, and bits of clothing. The decay of the bodies was extremely advanced, so about 18 months later, after the use of dental records and DNA evidence, the remains were confirmed to be those of the missing Jameson family. Like everything else in this case, there were very odd details about the discovery. 
First of all, the bodies were found in an area known as Smokestack Hollow and were located about 2.7 miles away from the location of the vehicle. If you're like me, you're wondering how in the heck such a huge search party missed the bodies. Well, turns out they were in the perfect spot to be almost inaccessible at the time. The area they were in was rarely traveled with no clearly defined path and they were located on a steep incline. This location was inconvenient to reach at the best of times. And if you'll recall, the search effort was bogged down by bad weather at the time. The location of the bodies was also not the end of the oddities. When they were discovered, the bodies were laid side by side right next to each other. To investigators, it seemed possible that this was an execution-style homicide, a theory that was further reinforced when the one skull, presumably Bobby's, was found to have a hole that would be consistent with a gunshot to the head if an assailant had Bobby on his knees. Yet again, there are issues with this theory. The hole in the skull cannot be confirmed to be a bullet hole, since there is no exit wound. And it's also possible that given the amount of time that the bodies were exposed to the elements, scavengers and rodents could have caused damage to the remains. In the end, the cause of death for all three Jamesons is labeled as unknown, since nothing can be definitively proven. By late 2013, the case had been out of the media for quite some time, but the discovery of the remains and their confirmed identification sparked a lot of new interest. The missing persons case turned potential homicide was just too enticing for internet sleuths to pass up. So, theories were expanded upon, and new ones were even formulated. First, because of course we can't let it go, there was continued speculation that the Jamesons were a casualty in a drug deal gone wrong. The idea is that it was some sort of setup and the family was executed in order to steal from them. Many speculate that the missing leather briefcase could have contained more money that the murderer stole, but there's no way to confirm that. Could it have been an execution for other reasons? Sherilyn's mother recalled that she had heard an odd statement Bobby had made to Sherilyn before the disappearance. He said, quote, I know where I can get the money, but I won't involve you. Could this point to some sort of debt or extortion? Could they have planned to meet with someone who stole the briefcase with more money or valuables on them? Or could the Jamesons have bluffed whoever was extorting them with the empty briefcase? And then, when the murderer found out it was empty, he exacted revenge on all three of them. Whatever the scenario, I find it unlikely. I mean, he literally said, I won't involve you. So why bring the whole family along? It just doesn't make any sense. Another theory that has made the rounds is that the money was initially an offering to a cult. While the theory has never officially been entertained, Sherilyn's mother, Connie, has some belief in this theory, mainly due to information that she found on the internet saying that Sherilyn was potentially on a cult, quote-unquote, hit list. Why? I have no idea. If there was any cult involvement, I would find it much more likely that if they did believe their home was really haunted... After their failure to gain help from the church or the satanic Bible, they became more desperate and attempted to find help from a cult in the woods. But even this has holes in it. Why then were the family murdered? Why was the money left behind? And the dog? Another dead end, unfortunately. While, yes, it's not entirely far-fetched to think that maybe the family stumbled upon something they shouldn't have and paid for it with their lives... I'm not sure that was the case. It could have just as easily been an opportunistic murderer or murderers. That sequence of events could look something like this. During their walk, the Jamesons stumble upon their assailants, make a run back for the car, and once there, attempt to drive off. Before they can get too far, a weapon, most likely a gun, is pulled on them and they're forced out of the car, leaving their belongings behind and they're marched into the woods. It's at this point that the killer or killers would presumably take Sherilyn's gun and the briefcase and lead the family into a secluded area, and carry out the deed. As I said before, there's no way to determine the cause of death for the three family members, so the method would be unknown. But this theory would explain the position and location of the bodies, the missing items, and the positioning of the car. If I'm being honest, even this theory doesn't fit perfectly, but this is one of the ones I find to be most likely. I mean, crazier things have happened. One of the final theories has to be the most tragic, and that is the idea that the family went out that day with the intention of dying. 
In order to understand this, I want to revisit the family's condition, both physically and psychologically. Obviously, something dark was going on in the household, and it was leaving them drained in multiple ways. Not only that, but to add on to Sherilyn's mental state at the time, she had reportedly been on a downhill trajectory after the death of her sister two years prior due to a bee sting. And that's not all. There was also the final transfer of custody of her son to her ex-husband, as well as her own hospitalization in September of 2009, after she had attempted to end her own life. Could this explain her mental state and, by extension, the letter? And could Sherilyn be responsible for the death of the family? Well, Sherilyn's friend Nikki says no. Quote, It, the letter writing was her form of therapy. She would write things down when they came to her mind, but then she would move on. She loved Bobby. Again, this explanation doesn't quite work. If the family met with a murder-suicide, then where were the missing items that seemed to keep throwing a wrench in all the theories, the gun, and the briefcase? Not just that, but why would they have left the dog behind? I can't imagine they would be so cruel to Maisie when, by all accounts... She was beloved and went everywhere with Madison. We can now see what Sheriff Beauchamp meant. There are so many potential leads, but not enough evidence to fully substantiate any of them. Let's go over the main speculations one more time. If you believe that the family fell to a drug deal gone wrong, then why were Madison and Maisie there? And why was the money left behind in the car? If you believe there was foul play by the grandfather, white supremacists, or even their associates, then why was nobody else besides the family seen in the area that day? And there was no strong evidence that any of the aforementioned parties were actually involved in any capacity. If you believe it may have been a murder-suicide plot, then where was the gun? And why was Maisie left to suffer in the car? And if you believe it was ghosts, demons, or something else paranormal... All I have to say is, what? The Jameson family case began pretty straightforward, but all the evidence wove a tangled weave over time where nothing comes together cleanly to form a full picture. Occam's Razor says that the simplest answer is usually the correct one. And in this case, unfortunately, I believe the most likely scenario is that the family was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, ran into someone with bad intentions, and unfortunately paid with their lives. Next time on Dakota and the Dark Side... Have you ever gotten a letter from a secret admirer? What happens when those letters go too far and anyone around you could be stalking every move you and your family make? Better lock your doors, check your windows. The Watcher may be just outside. I have a full season of mysteries, murders, and spooky tales to share with you. But if you have any suggestions or personal stories you would like to share, feel free to send me a DM on Instagram at DATDPod. Also, follow me on Instagram and Twitter at DATDPod for regular show updates. This episode was written and researched by me. A list of resources is available in the episode description. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review on your podcast provider. It really helps out a lot. See you soon, Darksiders. Darksiders.